Hello and welcome back to this museum where today, well today's a very sad day because we say goodbye to one of the Schmiemobiles and well Brad I think we're both going to miss this one. We 100% are, it's a really good car mm. and just to clarify it is not one of these four here, I know you looked at them just now but. No well they're just because they are Schmiemobiles and we're saying goodbye to a Schmiemobile yeah. but we are of course talking about the AMG GTR Roadster which you may have recently seen us preparing for sale which is now done. So I'm going to be jumping in that one while Brad, I think you're going to jump in the Cupra, which is outside at the moment, our new team car. And we're going to drop this off with Greg at Contemporary Classics. And yeah, it's going to be going to find a new home. And I think we are really, really going to miss it. As Brad said, it's a really good car. It pretty much fits every situation. And okay, we've driven it recently without the um, pole position bucket seats, and it's not quite the same, but still a phenomenal car yeah think. it's just that like it's an it's an all-rounder supercar it's yeah. got practicality comfort speed power noise looks like it does everything and speaking of those bucket seats they are actually just focus focus <laughs> they're over there they are i think you've been just taking a seat on those just imagining what they may be like in your car which i guess at some point may happen down the line maybe but every time you mention mods that might happen to my car, you are going to get me in trouble with my parents. Do you know how many times I get questioned? We, we may have teased um, a certain mod that's happening fairly soon to my car. Oh, you mean you... No, I won't do it again. Yeah, the, the thing we had to, to beep out. And I've been questioned many, many times about what is it, but it's a surprise. Well, mum and dad of Brad, those seats are about 50 quid each. It's fine, don't <coughs> worry, Brad can get some. But anyway... <laughs> Thanks, Tom. For the rest of you, they're a little bit more than that. Um, don't go looking for the minivan and offering people that because you'll get a firm no. But anyway, I think without further ado, it's probably time we jump in this and get the very last cold start. True. However, we haven't mentioned where we're going after we drop this to Greg. Do we do that now Classics. or do we do that later? I think we explain, I think we explain now roughly what's happening. Okay, well, we may as well just tell them then. Well, after this, Brad's got the Cupra, so we're going to be doing a kind of dual run. First of all, this is like the first real world test of the Cupra Born that we're doing, because Brad's been using it for the last couple of days, going home and back, and purposely hasn't charged that one. So he's going to be heading over to Greg at Contemporary with me. Then we're going to be heading over to see the guys at Quaif, and I'm sure you all know what that means. Something is getting an upgrade, and it is, of course, the Clio V6. Now. Being a mid-engine hatchback, they are renowned for being a little bit snappy. And I think one thing that's going to help cure all of that, along with all of the other bits we have coming, is a limited slip differential. So we're going to be going to see the guys at Quaif, to pick one of those up, and for them to talk us through exactly how that all works. So now, without further ado, let's get the cold start. First things first, before we... Oh. <laughs> Typical Mercedes GTR door. GTR doors. Um, first yeah. things first, before we get a cold start, we need to remove the CTEC smart charger. Who has the honours of the very last, me or you? I'll take... Oh no, this is on... It's on a quick so connection. We actually need to remove. We do, but... We should, um, we should probably do that before we hit the road. Ah, we can you can have the, You can have the last pop. I'm trying, I'm trying to do it with one hand, which isn't going okay, very well. Together. There we go, it's actually gone okay. I, it was just, I was holding it so tightly it wouldn't come apart. But there we go, there is that. So this is a CS1 that will now have to find a new home. Should we actually get that cold start now? Yeah, let's do it. Time to pull this one off of our Ben Pack auto stacker. Now you might be wondering, normally when we take the GCR Roadster out, the roof goes straight down. However, not, outside not today is, yeah. yeah, it's not playing ball with roof down. No, we've had a bit of a heat wave here in the UK lately, but today is not one of those days. Um, it's pouring down. And also, that's doubly dis not disappointing is the wrong word, but it's, for two reasons, it's not great that it's raining. First of all, no roof down. Second of all, what's it wearing? Some lovely Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2s. Which are phenomenal in the rain. Wait, they're not that great in the rain. They're not terrible, but they're not amazing in the rain. So. Um, Point number three, I can see a cobweb flying around on me somewhere. Um, point number three about why this weather's not great. Go on. Did we or did we not clean this very recently? 
Yeah, I did actually consider that, that it's going to get to Greg's and be filthy. Sorry, Greg. You're going to have to do it again, but we did do it for you. That was part of the preparation for sale. Um, yeah, I the guess. The weather has other thoughts. Yeah, you get ready to tackle the British, the normal British weather, the thing we're used to. Yeah. I'll get ready to jump back in the Cooper and we will get over to contemporary classics. Have you noticed, no matter what the weather is, is here in Britain, we always think it's either too hot or it's raining. Yeah, there's no like... There's no like, oh, it's just a lovely day today. Yeah. Anyway, let's, let's go. go. Inside the Cupra Born then, and just wanted to clarify, but when we first had the car delivered, obviously we didn't know that you get in, press the brake and the car starts and obviously put it into gear. The B on the gear select stands for brake regeneration. Um, and we we're also told by some of you guys in the comments that when you get out of the car, there's obviously seat sensors that know when you've got out and it will turn the car off once you put it in park. We did figure all that out pretty quickly after actually driving it and using it. But obviously when we first had it turn up, we were pretty unaware of it. But in front of me is the GTR Roadster. Tom is just getting ready to go. We have 186 miles of range off a of 68% of charge, which is good. I'm not sure how far we have to drive. So hopefully today we're okay. We don't run out of charge and don't need to find a charger on the on route. Um, but yeah, a bit of a round trip to do. A few things to sort, this to drop off, clear parts to collect. Yeah, let's uh, get on the road. So, foot on the brake, car starts up, and I can pop into drive and we can get on our way. And we have made it here to Contemporary Classics with the GTR Roadster. And as you can see, we even had enough of a break in the rain that the roof did come down towards the end of the journey. I was quite jealous watching the roof come down in front of me, just folding in place. Just, I just did it looking in the rear view mirror at your face and it wasn't one of being impressed. No. I was searching for a button in there <laughs> to take the roof off, but unfortunately we don't have a sunroof on it. So no. windows just went down to kind of get the same experience. And we could get the roof off, but I'm not sure Cooper would appreciate us doing so. No, with some tools and angle grinders. But speaking of Cooper, we actually have 153 miles of range on there currently. I feel like it's doing okay. I mean, although it is going to do a full circumference of the M25 today, but I think it's now time that we hand this one over to Greg at Contemporary Classics. And speaking of which, I think we need to go inside there and have a look at some of what he's got because he has some amazing cars in stock. Not that this isn't amazing as well, but some real, real classics in there that I think all petrol heads will love. So let's dive in there. So we're joined by Greg from Contemporary. Welcome to the channel again. Thanks, mate. Um, I think we last saw you sourcing our Clio V6 project We car. did, yeah. Yeah, which we're going to have to get you back in touch with that at Most some point once it's to, finished. need to see how that's, that's coming on. Yeah, but speaking of Clio V6s, you've actually got a couple more in here yes. amongst quite a few other bits and pieces, as we, I'd love to we say. We have got a bit of a sweet spot for them um, yes. amongst some more quirky stuff. So yeah, uh, if you look right at the far back there, there's a, a 28,000 mile um, titanium silver car and then a 17 and a half thousand mile black gold one as well. <laughs> and this, the, the scary thing is, these aren't the only two you have, are they? No, 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 there, are more, got more. there are more coming. Yeah, there's, there's <laughs> one at the detailer now, there's one on the way back from Ireland. Um, so they're, they're coming in thick and fast at the moment, which I, is always fun. I think fun. it's fair to say you are one of the biggest dealers of Clio V6s at the moment. It's kind of a weird, weird niche to have though, right? Yeah. Oh, like, it's really cool though. Quir cause... Quirky cars as, as they go. But yeah, we, we love them and they're, they're good fun. As as you guys are now experiencing yes. in, oh, in, yes. in the project. But speaking of fast Renaults, I'm, I'm really drawn to this. Renault Megane R26R, this was, I mean, this is an absolute weapon still to this day. Yeah, look, I, I think with these, they've kind of fallen off the radar a bit over the last five yeah. years. You know, people forgot about them and, and other things came out that were quicker. But at the yeah. time, this was just mega, you know, a baby GT3. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing, in the right hands, this will yeah. keep up with a GT3 around a circuit or pretty much any supercar. A hundred percent. And you know, they have, it even has in the window, the sticker of the Nürburgring record time. Um, yes. Which, what is it? Not a lot. Eight, eight minutes and 17 seconds, which yeah. like nowadays is terrible, frankly. Yeah. Um, but that's not, it's kind of missing the point with this. It's, it's such a brilliant driver's car. Yeah. Um, and given what values are done on the Clio V6s, we very much think these are the next ones that are going to go absolutely nuts in price. It um, is one of the only kind of performance cars of this era of this magnitude that hasn't really rocketed. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So it's, and again, it's full carbon fiber. You've got the Perspex windows, which is the bucket seats. Yeah, I are, think it's, a, it's 167 kilos lighter than a standard Megan R26, which, which is, is, that's a person, a bit. It's right. a lot. It's, it's, it's a, a lot of weight to weight. take out of a car. I mean, nowadays, when we have a lightweight version of something, it's 30 kilos lighter, 40 kilos. And it's, we haven't really tried. This is extreme yeah, to the time. max. But I mean, not, not as extreme as this necessarily. No, true, but this pretty is extreme. 
This is extreme. Talk us through this. This is, this yes, is different. This is. So Lotus 340R, uh, essentially uh, uh, a lightweight Elise, um, the first series Elise that came out. You okay. know, they did it initially as, as a concept and they put it out there. People went nuts. It was kind of, let's take the Chapman philosophy a bit further, take the doors <laughs> off, take the roof off, just go absolutely nuts. Yeah. Um, the, the, the goal was trying to do 300, 340 brake horsepower per ton. Okay. Um, they didn't hit it, so instead yeah. they just used the name and made 340 of them. It was okay. kind of an, an easy fix on that front. Um, yeah, but mega, mega cool car. This particular one's, I mean, it's been in the collection for the last 20 years. It's done 2,400 miles from new. Wow. And, um, if you want to get really nerdy about it, the very first 50 cars that were produced um, had the option for carbon fiber wheel arches. Okay. As this lot, one has. As this one has. A lot of people didn't take them because they were going to take it on the track and it made more sense just to have fiberglass and that if makes they sense. broke, you weren't too precious about it. Um, but yeah, really, really wicked car that I think as Lotus are going the EV way and yeah. making that shift, um, again, these things are, are going to be very sought after in the near future. Yeah, obviously, I mean, we've got the Elise back at this museum that's been yeah. known to us. I've been running around lately in an Evora as well, actually, as a courtesy car for Tim's 675. So that's sure. that's great fun. So I think we're falling in love with Lotus at the moment. Yeah. But this is, yeah, as you said, going to another level. But I do just want to go over the back because you've got it. something else really, really special here, which I think, I, I'm not going to say we've saved the best till last, but a lot of people may think that you have a gorgeous M3 CSL. Correct. Yeah, we, we spent a while trying to find a good one of these. Um, it's a 24,000 mile car yep. in black, which is the slightly rarer, rarer color of you. you Most are gray, it. aren't they? Most are gray, yeah. I yeah. think that the gray tends to accentuate the carbon roof a little bit more, um, yes. but the black is just super sharp and a lovely car that's you know been looked after meticulously. Um, and again, they, they've gone crazy in price as well. Um, you know, this is this is a 105k car where we've got it listed at the moment. Wow. But then the thing is, it's it's got those three letters on the end, right? CSL, yeah. and, and they're worth a lot of money. Um, and you know, do, do they keep going up like this over the next couple of years? I think maybe they take a bit of a pause around here, but still, a, an incredible car to, to own. And I almost think that this one, being the perfect segue, yes, is the one that's going to go crazy, right? The, yeah. the one M coupe. Um, you Which know, is still fairly reasonable value uh, if we yeah, can call yeah, them yeah. that. No, really, a hundred percent. I mean, it's it's half the price of the CSL. Yeah. It's, as special it's as fun to drive yeah um and i think a lot of people are going to go okay those are those are cool the cSLs are cool but this is actually equally cool and half the price so yeah. it, it's an interesting car to get involved in arguably um, a little bit more fun to drive being that shorter wheelbase being turbocharged it likes going sideways yeah 100 yeah, yeah, and so. and the manual gearbox as well right yeah. i mean i know a lot of people do stick the stick the manuals in the cSLs now but yeah. out the factory manual only just Mega. And I mean, in terms of that, would you, you know, if a nice one came up that was manual converted, is that something you'd take on or would you just stick to the... No, 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 we would take it on. I think that the key with these cars and all kind yeah. of collectible investment cars in general is it doesn't matter necessarily if things have been changed as long as you still have the originals, right? Yeah. So a lot of people who are doing the, the conversions on these, they know just keep the original running gear and stuff from the auto box um, because yeah, it's brilliant, but it is very slow. Yeah, it's not the best gearbox in the world, but... Yeah, times have moved on. Back they in have. the day. Oh, it was it was, it was revolutionary, right? <laughs> but yeah, well, thank you very much for letting us have a look Thanks around. Thanks for coming, guys. It was I good think... to see you. And there we are, the very last view, not that it's a particularly great one, but the very last view of the MG GTR Roadster. It's, uh, it's a sad day. Let me just sit in the mirror. Oh, can I get a... No, okay, I kind no, of missed it. I, I, you can't sit in the mirror. I'll tell you how you can sit. We get there one you go. Last. Oh, you can't really see No. It. Okay. Well, that that, that doesn't quite work. Well, yeah, the GTR Roadster is now with Greg. So if anyone's interested in a GTR Roadster, you know who to contact. Yeah, give Greg a shout and he will be happy to talk you through everything there. But yeah, that's gone. We now are off to the guys at Quaif Engineering. Yep. And we are going to grab an LSD for the Clio V6. And it's actually lovely seeing another few in there. Yeah, it's like, I mean, we only saw, we actually have only seen R1 fairly recently. Yeah. Just popping into John's every now and again. But it's still but nice seeing one that's more. whole. Yeah, <laughs> like they can be started and driven. Yes, yeah, yeah. And soon R1 will be too, but unlike those ones there, which again are complete OEM examples. Yeah. Really low mileage. Ours is slightly less mileage, going to be far from OEM. And I don't think we're going to mind driving it. 
No, not at all. So we have a 50 minute drive, 42 miles and 149 miles of range. I've actually, oh, that's cool. Oh, that Old is school. really cool. Yeah, fair Old play to you. Golf. I can't tell if it's a Mark 1 or Mark 2, should probably know, but cool either way. Um, yeah, I 100, think that was Mark 2. Yeah, 149 miles of range. Um, I've actually been driving it the whole way in range mode. So okay. obviously it helps pull out the most. Because I was gonna say, one thing that range. I probably should say is I wasn't particularly kind to you. I didn't cruise, I didn't, I just got on the road and went and yeah, said, yeah. you're following we, me. We got 70 and that was it. We just had yeah. the speed limit the whole way. And I was, you know, but when we got to, is, when we just, got to some of these lanes, I was giving it a boot for when you were doing your best to keep up, which yeah, obviously like, isn't. We've just gone from a 30 into a 50. So I've put it into Cooper mode with one button and then. Wow. Oh, back. that's pokey. That's the first the, time I felt that. The, I think the good, the good thing about this, and I think with a lot of the EV stuff, is it's obviously that instant torque. Yeah. So in this case, from 30 up to 50, and anywhere around that sort of bracket, is where when you do put your foot down, it's a bit like, whoa, like, where's, well, that, where's that power come from? But what that's not good for is range, is the, the no, key true. point I'm making here. So I've not, I've not been driving with, I guess, you and the range of this in mind. I've not been going, well, I should, you know, do sensible speeds or accelerate gently in order to preserve or for you to preserve battery i've just gone and yeah stick with no, of me course. so if i was to get in and do a like a long range actual cruise to try and save range i'd be sitting at 5 10 under the, the speed limit on the motorway 60 65 miles an hour on cruise just rolling along and that's how i would try and preserve some range but i think that's why that's, that yeah. makes this a better real world test though because it's being driven just normally it's not be you know we're not trying to preserve range we're not being careful we're just driving the car yeah so i see something or mclaren technology center we'll see yes. some mclaren's around it we need to keep our eyes out yes we'll keep waffling a little bit longer to see if we can get to the roundabout or do we just not say anything you just point out the window and we'll quickly speed up from here to there Let's do artificially that. in the edit not real speed and we've made it to the roundabout we have there we go so hopefully you guys enjoyed that sped up bit of footage yeah, we actually went uh, through. And there we are. Lights. We went through light speed. McLaren Technology Center, and we see an Audi. No, no <laughs> McLarens. Same thing, not the same thing. Car. It's a car. It's got four wheels and a steering wheel. We tried. Yeah. But anyway, let's head on to Quaife, and we'll see you guys soon. So we've just pulled into the services, and we appear to have a Fiesta ST Owners Club meet going on. One of which being a lovely performance edition. Is that the same colour as the Heritage? It is, yeah. It's yeah. like the exact, I don't know if they did like a different shade or different name, so that's the exact same colour. And I don't know if you remember, but a while back, Tim actually had one of those on order. Did and it? never took delivery oh, of it. Do you know it. what? I actually never knew that. Maybe that's Tim, bad. And yeah. Tim, if I was meant to know that, sorry. <laughs> I mean, it was a video that he put out to the whole of the internet. Oh, yeah, yeah. I definitely, I watched all of Tim's videos. I watched every single one. I've watched it, everything. It was a while back. I'm not going to lie. I forgot myself, if I'm completely honest, and was actually reminded by... Uh, ST Rach, Rachel Buckley, who came down to visit with her okay. performance edition, which was wrapped in like rose gold. But it was her that reminded me that, Should oh, actually, no, let's not. We're not <laughs> in a Fiesta ST. That's fine. We're um, in a Cooper Born. Yeah, no, let's not do that. I, I kind of feel like we should just go around car park spotting now. But anyway, we've just stopped off for a quick bite to eat. So, um, yeah, let's go and get some food. 2,000 years later. Here we go, 109 miles of range left and we have arrived at Quaif Engineering. We have indeed, so I think we should go inside, say hello to the guys here. Let's go and get a diff of the Clio. So we're now inside here at Quaif and we've got some lovely bits on display, but to talk us through them, we're currently joined by Dave King from Quaif. How are you doing? Hi there guys, yeah, very good, thank you, yourself? Not too bad, not good too good. bad. So we're gonna go around and have a quick tour of your facilities and you'll be able to explain to everyone far better than either of yeah, us can well, hopefully. what's what, um, yeah. because you've clearly got some some stuff going on here. Yeah. So should we go and take a look? I show you, yeah, let's so, go. Let's go. So you join us inside the factory here at Quaif, surrounded by machines and lots of noise, so I do apologize if it's uh, a bit noisy in the background, but. We've also got some stuff going on here, which I'm hoping you can explain to us. Yeah, so basically what we've got here is a flange for our 60G six-speed sequential gearbox that okay. we make. So yep. most people know us for our ATB differentials. When you yep. say Quaife, that's what they think of. Yep. Um, but actually we supply a, a considerable amount of uh, sequential gearboxes as well. Um, so this is a, a rear flange. So what we have is we um, have the billets here cut down. Um, so we actually order them in three meter lengths. They're then sawn out in the saw shed. Okay. Um, and this is the first operation. Um, so what we've got so, here. So is that literally comes from that block of billet. Exactly that. So we've 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 done the first turning off on this on this part. 
um, it will then get turned around and, and will machine the second side. Wow. Okay, that's really impressive to know that that comes from some... I guess it makes sense when you think about it, but when you're not in this environment, you just think it's a part, it gets made, it gets... You don't think it starts like that and ends up there? No. And it's, they're, they're, this is the first of many operations, so people always come in and they say, wow, I didn't realise how much work it took to yeah. get to that point, um, where it's actually in a car, a car and doing what it's supposed to be doing. Amazing. And you guys do a lot of stuff for OEMs, I know you were saying, and you've got some bits yeah. somewhere with, with some of them. Should we have a look at those? Yeah, by all means, yeah. Cool. So Dave tells me that this here is a gear. Now it doesn't look much like a gear Not in a moment. to me. It will be, very okay. shortly. So I'm guessing that ends up as those there. Exactly that. So okay. this is a side gear for the ATB differential. So yep. you'll have two of these in your ATB. Yep. Uh, one left hand helix and one right hand helix. Yep. Uh, this one here is actually for the Ford Transit. Okay. Um, so we currently ship around 240 Ford Transit uh, ATB differentials a week. Okay, that's quite a lot. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we do a considerable amount for Ford, and there are other OEMs that we, we ship differentials out uh, yeah. to. Um, yeah, so it starts life as, as a turn, so this has had two operations, so we've had the first turning off and then the second turning off, and now yeah. it's on the, on the hobber. Uh, being hobbed for, for the helix angle. Okay, so it's, and it's that actually a left-hand helix. Oh, sorry, a right-hand helix. Yeah, okay. So yeah. the way you term, determine that is which way is the the, the cut is, yeah. is the cut going. So it's a right-hand helix sun gear. Okay. So we're now at the next stage or next part of the factory. Sorry, and here we have something I believe you said was for a Ford GT40. Yes. Yeah, which so is quite a special car. It is. So we there's a lot of companies currently that are doing recreations of the GT40 yeah, because the originals yeah. are so expensive. And everyone loves to look at an original Mark, Mark II GT40. Um, so we manufacture the 62G, which is our five-speed uh, synchro mesh gearbox that okay. is designed to look like the original ZS, but okay. not cost as much as the uh, original ZS. Okay, so um, it's a far so more, far more cost-friendly alternative exactly. to. Okay, yeah. So what we have here is is a, a single part that is machined again from a solid bit of billet. Um, so this is all milling, so we've actually got one loaded up in the machine as we speak at the moment. Um, so this just shows the extent of what goes into the manufacturing of one single gearbox, and this yeah. is one component. And this is one of, I'm, I'm guessing, very, you know, many components there's that probably, go into it. I'd imagine there's probably between 250 to 300 parts in the yeah. actual gearbox. And all of those go through a process similar to this, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. And this, is, this is one of the smaller parts of the gearbox we've yeah. got the main cases as well which i can show you um which are machined down at our dealing room site okay so this site here in seven oaks is around uh, twenty thousand square feet but this site down in dealing room is thirty thousand square feet so it's a, a bigger okay. site okay um that's <laughs> that's where all of the atv differentials are manufactured and the uh castings are all machines um, yep. The machines down there are far more impressive. Okay. Uh, just due to the size. You say that, well, I'm blown away by what we've seen here already. So to know it only gets better, I think we definitely need to visit that site well, one day. You're more than welcome. Amazing, thank you. So um, yeah, should we have a look at the cases? Yeah, let's go and have a look. Cool. Okay, so here we have the finished cases that you were saying about, and this at some point is going to find its way into a GT40 recreation, I guess. Exactly that. Point. So these, these are built up. So we've seen um, the various different machining ops on, on this one. Um, this is built up, subbed up, ready to have the gear cluster put in it as soon as the parts come through from the factory. Um, so this will go out to a GT40 customer and hopefully be in a car fairly shortly. Amazing. Well, I think it's been absolutely great to go through pretty much the entire process, at least, of, of the gearboxes, how they're made and the components. And, and again, this is pretty much where it ends up. But I guess without further ado, we've all been teasing you this whole video. We should go and have a look at our diff. What is the reason you're here? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. So let's go and find that one yep. and let you can talk us through that. Perfect. Yep, we'll go and do that. So we're now sat around a table, which is quite weird, I appreciate, but Dave's got these lovely examples of what the ATB diff is and what's yep. inside, which is going to fully explain to us and everyone what it does, how it works, yeah, and so why you need one. Yeah, so standard cars, like your clear, yep. come with an open differential. Yep. Open differential, without being too technical about it, just means that the power and the torque would always find the easiest route out. Yep. So what happens is, as soon as one wheel starts to lose grip, it will just spin that one wheel. Yeah. Not ideal in 
especially a Clio where it's rear wheel drive, yeah. Yeah. Um, quite short, so it'd be very, very snappy. So yes. what you actually want to do is rather than wasting that power and it going out of, you know, into thin air, yeah. is we want to bias that torque and put it to the opposite wheel. To the one that actually has traction. Exactly yeah. that. Um, there are different ways of doing that. There's different differentials on the market. Mm -hmm. Most people, you know, they call them LSDs, which limited slip differential, which yep. is technically the, the ATB is. Yeah. Um, ATB stands for automatic torque biasing. Okay. Um, so plate differentials have friction clutch plates inside them mm. and ramp angles. Okay. And what will happen is once the um, preload on the on the wheel, once the torque on the wheel hits the set preload it will unlock the diff and then the ramps will start to ride up the ramp angle okay. and then lock it again. So they're locking yeah. diffs. Okay, so um, that, at that point, you've effectively got both wheels spinning. Both wheels spinning at, at the exact same, same speed. speed. Yeah. yeah, so 50-50 torque yeah. to, to each wheel. Um, what we're looking for is non-wearing parts. So with a uh, plate type differential, there are clutch plates in there, they yeah. wear over time. So mm -hmm. they're a motorsport diff where you have to go in there, you have to replace the plates, you have yeah. to, uh, it's a service lot, lots of the messing item. about. Yeah, yeah. Um, lots of setup as well with different ramp angles, different clutch plates, things like that. Yeah. So, what we're looking to do, and what, what we've done, and we've done successfully for over fifty years now, I believe, um, is we've produced a, a, a limited slip differential that has no wearing parts. Okay. Um, no part of this differential wears, and what happens is it can bias more than just the fifty-fifty that a plate diff can do. Yeah. Um, so. What happens is when one wheel starts to spin, uh, the torque is actually biased back through the differential into the opposite wheel. Um, so try and explain a little bit the way it does that. Um, what you have inside the differential is, um, here is your side gear, so where one drive shaft yeah. would, would fit. Um, you then have your um, pin, pinions, worm yeah. gears, there's lots of different names for them, we call them pinions. Yeah. Um, so what happens is when this wheel starts to spin, because of the helix angle on the side gear here, it will actually try and force it into the housing. Obviously okay. it can't go anywhere because yeah. there's a metal housing there. Um, and then what will happen is the torque will bias through the pinion. So effectively the pinion will try and do that. Okay. Obviously in here you can see there's a pinion pocket. Um, the pinions can't go anywhere, yeah. so it can't physically do that. Um, which will mean then that it will bias to an opposite pinion. Okay. So there'll be another pinion opposite helix that will that will sit roughly here. Right. Um, and then another side gear on top. So it will bias from this pinion into the opposite helix pinion, into the opposite helix sun gear, into the drive shaft. Okay. <clears throat> so you've basically taken the, the natural physics, if you like, of exactly. what happens when, when you spin up yeah. an inside wheel generally. Yeah. Um, You've taken the natural physics of that and gone, okay, let's play with this and yeah. use that to send the power to the opposite exactly side. Exactly that. So, Quaif ATBs come with lifetime warranty, purely okay. because, and even in motorsport use. So, you could be okay. a, a, a motorsport company, um, you could be a racer that races every, every Sunday. Um, there's a lifetime warranty. There's not okay. many people that do that in motorsport that I know, no, not no. Many manufacturers. I think most parts, the moment you start getting down to track use, any warranty yeah. you had is, is void and gone. Yeah. And we're that confident. So we currently ship around 2,500 ATV diffs a month. Just a um, couple of them. Yeah, we have about, it says up there, about 500 <laughs> yeah. different applications. Okay. Um, that we're able to supply for. Um, I think we, I'd say we are the largest aftermarket supplier of differentials in the world. Okay. Wow, that's um, that's amazing. And again, a lot of these, of, of these and, and more, you'll find these yeah. products in as a standard. Yeah, yeah. So there, there, there's a, a fair few companies out there that now use us as their OEM supplier of aftermarket, essentially differentials. And I think that just goes to show if, <clears throat> if they're good enough for the manufacturers themselves, the people that are building these cars, this is more than good enough for our yep. Clio V6 and whatever it is you happen to drive. So if you have anything and you find yourself often spinning up an inside wheel, this right here is what you need. And what I would say is it's always an afterthought. It is. <laughs> People it always is. go big turbos, you know, because it's good pub talk. That, yep. Oh, my car's got 500, 600, 700 horsepower. Yep. They make the car undrivable and then they go, oh, I'm only spinning one wheel. I need to fit a quick yeah. diff. And 
anyone I talk to who's fitted one, bang for buck, they've said it's the best modification they've ever done to the car. Um, if you're thinking about one, find someone that's got a quaff diff fitted to their car, yeah. go and try one. Um, the only way that I can explain it, certainly myself, my own feelings, is that when you're driving with a, an open diff, mm -hmm. it feels like someone's pushing the back of the car. Yeah. Um, so you're going around the corner, it feels like it's trying to understeer, it's trying to push you on. Yeah, with I an ATB, that. it feels like someone's got a rope on the front of the car and they're pulling you around to the yeah. corner. Um, it's just that sensation that the front just wants to tuck in, exactly wants to that. hit the apex and just go. Yeah. And what you'll find, if, you, if you've been on a, a B road that you know very well and you're used to driving it with, a, with an open diff, yeah. when you then fit a quaff diff, you'll realise that you've been allowing for a little bit of understeer. You'll actually turn in too early and okay. you'll have to back out again and yeah. then turn in again. Um, it's a really weird sensation if you're you know, going fairly well, obviously within the speed limits of the of road course. and everything. Yep. Uh, but yeah, if you turn into a corner, you'll, you'll, you'll be find turning in too, early, the yeah, too yeah. early because you've allowed for that initial bit of understeer. Which is um, amazing. Yeah, and I think, I think like you were saying, it, it is an afterthought. You see so many cars out there, especially rear drive cars, M140s, yeah. M240s, M, you know, all of these things, and they've got four, 500 horsepower. If you can't put it down, exactly, yeah. it, it's, it's all well and good saying you've got this much power, but yeah. you've got to be able to put this power to the ground. Yeah. And Tires and differentials yeah. are the most overlooked part of most yeah. cars. I agree. So I'm very glad we've got this there. And actually, yep. Brad, we've behind got... the camera, if you was to just look over there, we have our diff for the Clio. So I think we should probably get this open and take a look at what it looks like when it's not in yeah, clear the... perspex <laughs> case. <laughs> yeah. There she is. There we are. And that is what's going to transform the driving experience of the V6. Because, I mean, as you were saying, they're, they're quite a short wheelbase. Yeah. They're quite square. And when one goes... Not ideal for it, a rear-wheel drive it, car. No. <laughs> when it goes, it goes. Yeah. And I think this is going to be... I think it's going to be night and day. Hopefully, yeah. I'm interested um, to see yeah. your thoughts on it. Certainly when uh, you try you know, the comparison between yeah. the old car and, and a new car. We've actually got thanks to our friend Greg at Contemporary Classics, a stock one oh, to try. So yeah. he's actually got that, we just came from him actually, but he's got one that we can go out in, perfect. see what it's like OEM, because yeah. obviously we're doing quite a few bits to our one. Yeah. Um, so that way we'll be able to appreciate the difference. It's gonna be, so, gonna be a different beast, I think. Yeah, well Dave, thank you so much Pleasure. for no your time. At all, anytime. I guess we should get this loaded back up into the Cooper and head back towards the Museum. We are making good progress back towards the Museum, and Brad, we've got a tunnel run coming up. I know, shall we, so what we need to do here, this button is the, uh, the good old Cupra button, so we'll put it into Cupra mode. Okay. And then we can just like, slow down a little bit. It's average speed, 50. We're currently doing like 35 miles an hour. Yep, absolutely. And no one behind us anywhere near. Accelerate to 50. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was noisy. Hang on, we, should, we should make the noises this time. Ready? Play, face that way. People want to see where we're going. Uh, uh, done. <laughs> anyway, back into range mode. Uh, cruise control at 50. <laughs> and we can cruise through the Dartford Crossing. <sighs> Guys, can you see what I have to put up with? You started this, you said we're doing, we've got a tunnel run, which obviously means we need to pop and bang and all of that stuff. Yeah, I was taking the mickey because we're in a car which makes no noise here in this glorious tunnel where I've made plenty of noise in various different cars over the years. I was just taking the mickey because clearly we can't and you go and do that. And there we are, we are back with our Quaif LSD the Clio V6, actually a little bit heavy, so I'm gonna pop that one down. But I cannot wait to get back to Scott at SG Motorsport and get this fitted among everything else you guys saw last time we're up there and a few bits you haven't yet seen. So they'll be coming very soon. Once again, just wanna say a huge thank you to every single one of you who's following along on this Clio V6 journey and is absolutely loving it as well. The comments have been brilliant. And of course, it's a sad day, as we said at the start, because, well, where the GTR Roadster should be, well, it's now been replaced with a go-kart, which isn't quite the same. I appreciate it's open top, though, and Brad loves it, but... No? Yeah. Go-kart's great, but we need, it. <laughs> we need a faster one. <laughs> but we have to have something to sit on that lift, so it's the go-kart for now. We do need a faster one, so I think that's something we do yep. need to keep pressuring Tim into once he's back. Yep. Also? Also? We did make it back. We did. <laughs> Obviously, we are we here. We did, yes. We are and here. We had about 16% of battery left. Yeah. I can't remember how much mileage that was. Um, still a good amount where you could 
head out from here and do shopping trips, I mean, trips, we've done a full loop of the M25 because of where we went. From 60% charge. And we've done various stop-offs along the way. We've stopped for food, a couple other bits we haven't shown you off camera. So I'm actually really impressed with the range of this car. Not going to say anything else, but the range... I am very impressed with so far. It's actually usable. You, you, you can use it. Like one of my fears has always been with an electric car. Well, you know, by the time you go home, you go out, pop to the shops, do something. If an emergency crops up, what, what do you do? Because at that point you haven't got charge. You've got to wait for the car. Like this all of a sudden doesn't have that issue seemingly. It just works in the real world. But as I said, thanks everyone for coming along on this journey. Hopefully you've enjoyed and until next time.